little math magic today. And, uh, you know, this might seem a little technical. Some people are, are like challenged by numbers, but it's helpful from a policy perspective and just to kind of raise public awareness. Um, also to kind of showcase the impact for community composting because a lot of people think that can't do the numbers. A lot of industry people are like, community composting is cute, but can't do the numbers. So we want to be able to show them that we can do the numbers uh, in terms of waste diversion. So we're going to kind of talk through kind of the site design process and how to estimate your processing capacity. Also helps if you're trying to advocate with your local municipality to start up a, a community compost program. It'll also help you in your design and proposal development um, and generally in communicating about the impact of your project, whether to the public or to um, state officials. We are going to estimate our compost processing capacity based on area size because uh, generally our sites are small, so they're going to be limited in size. And so we want to have some idea of what that capacity is. It's not set in stone because you can always get creative and create more space on your site um, to process more materials. Um, but this is a way to get an idea of how to understand the processing capacity of your space. And then we're going to take those numbers um, and translate them into greenhouse gas benefits. So our carbon dioxide equivalent um, and you can use this process to take your actual data of what you actually measured um, in food waste diversion and get an estimate of your actual greenhouse gas um, emissions reductions. And then we're going to translate that into uh, terms that lay people can understand, such as cars removed from the road, miles driven that were saved, um, gasoline quantity that was saved, etc. So at this point we've done a lot of composting with three bin systems and windrow systems and so we already kind of know based on the size of the three bin system. Our earlier three bin systems were smaller and there's some new ones that are larger in size so that's going to change the volume and processing capacity. But our old kind of three bin system processes approximately 300 pounds of food waste a week in terms of its capacity. For the windrows at Debs, um, they're really packing in a lot of food waste in there. So they're processing about 3,000 pounds of food waste a week. They did mention there was one time they processed like 6,000 pounds. And over time, um, they have kind of expanded the use of that space. Originally, there were some pretty small windrows there. Um, and they've kind of made more space. There used to be a lot of tr trees on the hillside. And so they've cleared out a lot of those trees. And so they've really expanded the amount of space that's dedicated to the windrows there. So that's what I mean in terms of creative adjustments to your site and to be able to expand your processing capacity. So we talked a lot about compost site elements. Um, so these, the area dedicated to your compost, you know, is not just for your compost processing, but also feedstock storage and other activities. For kind of like larger scale processors, maybe they want to think about like, you know, how much waste material is being produced and then how much land area they need to process all of that material. Um, but because we're generally dealing with more limited area size, uh, we're going to start with just like our area limitations. But if you don't have space limitations, you can estimate like how much organic material is being generated and how much land area you need to process that. So that might be helpful on a municipal scale if we were thinking about how do we compost all of the organic waste in the city. You know, you can estimate all of the organic waste being generated in the city. And, you know, if you want to process all of that through community composting, think about the land area needed for all of that and kind of divide it among different community hubs throughout the city. So that is kind of another way to think about it. So there's a couple questions to think about in when you're thinking about the area size and processing capacity. Um, what we're going to figure out is how much organic waste you can process per week. Um, but one thing, one ver like so there's a couple of variables that can be different for you based on your system. So one is how long is your composting process from start to finish? You know, is it a three month process, six month process, year long process, depending on what your approach is? 
How large do you want your windrows or bins to be in terms of their dimensions and volume? And what space do you have available to, to do all of that work in terms of managing traffic, feedstock storage, um, screening, et cetera, tool storage? And then the capacity of your site will probably determine the type of equipment that you're going to use. So if your windrows were getting bigger than the ones at Debs, you're probably going to think about getting some machinery, like a bucket loader or a skid steer or something like that. Um, if it's the size of those windrows at Debs or smaller, then you can probably rely on community volunteers and pitchforks. So we're going to start with based on site size as the limitation. So first thing you want to do in your design is understand where your composting area is, have an estimate of the dimensions of that area, and then start to place your different site elements, so your feedstock storage, um, tool shed, uh, screening area, and then your active compost area. So where are your piles and your windrows going to go? How are they going to get turned? Um, and then think about what size dimensions those piles and windrows are going to be. So if you want to do kind of big round piles that are more just like circular, like uh, Randy's piles, like maybe they'll be five foot uh, in diameter, five foot tall, um, five foot in diameter. <laughs> if they're going to be long windrows, maybe they'll be five feet wide, five feet tall and like 15 feet long and you can decide you know, what, how long you want those windrows to be. So for our example site, where I'm going to walk you through the calculations. Um, this is an example at Buena Vista. So we carved out that space for composting. And I didn't include the feedstock, I didn't r mark out the feedstock storage areas, but generally speaking, our food scrap drop-off is kind of right in the front here. Um, our, mul our manure pile is kind of right here. Um, so our mulch was kind of in this area too, but in this example I kind of imagined the mulch pile to be more outside here. Um, so I had just mapped out kind of the active composting area in this example. So we have it split up into our three rows and um, I mapped out like three windrows for each row. So this is our kind of fresh piles Active, compo active cooking piles and our maturation piles uh, by the fence. So in this example, the windrows are five feet wide, five feet tall, and 10 feet long. The little pathways between those aisles are about three to four feet for uh, wheelbarrows and people to walk through and space for people to be working those piles. Um, there's three windrows in each row and we have a six month compost processing time from start to finish. So, first thing we want to figure out is our windrow volume uh, for one windrow. And that is our cross-sectional area times the windrow length. So basically, you take the base width times the height and multiply by 0.66 as like a adjustment factor for the kind of half cylinder shape for the parabolic shape. So the volume of our windrow, five feet wide times five feet high times 0.66 for that parabolic adjustment and then times 10 feet long. And so we get a total volume of 165 cubic feet and then we can convert that to cubic yards. So it's about 6.1 cubic yards for one windrow. And the next step is to look at the total compost volume. So we have nine windrows total of this size on that site. And so we take that six cubic yards per windrow times nine windrows, and that gives us 55 cubic yards total. So that's our total compost volume. And uh, we can make adjustments if we want to increase that total compost volume. For example, like we could, I, I made some space between the windrows so we could like squeeze those windrows in together more. Um, we could kind of expand that total area. Um, so those are some like small tweaks that could expand our compost capacity. But we'll just stick with this for now. So from there, we kind of back calculate 
the volume of our initial compost pile, which may be a full windrow or it may be like half a windrow. So we're going to just try to estimate that. So in order to calculate the volume of our first pile that we're building from fresh feedstock, we take that total volume of material that we can hold, we divide it by the length of the composting period times the shrinkage factor. So the compost is going to lose volume as it decomposes over time. From my estimate, it's about 50%. Other people have different estimates. And I think it's you know, a really great opportunity for this grant program to be able to see like what other people's kind of um, shrinkage factors are. So that's the um, variables I'm going to use is a six month processing time. So on a weekly basis, that's 24 weeks times about 50%. So we plug that into the formula. So our total compost volume was 55 cubic yards divided by the 24 weeks times 0.5, and that gives us 4.6 cubic yards for our initial compost pile. So in terms of this system, the kind of biggest fresh pile we can build is 4.6 cubic yards, and that's maybe about two-thirds of that windrow size. Then we have to look at our compost recipe, because each of our feedstock materials is going to have a different bulk density and so it's gonna to contribute to the volume and the weight a little bit differently. So our compost recipe is approximately three parts food waste, four parts wood chips, and one part manure. And so we, when we break it down by proportion based on that initial compost pile volume, we have 4.6 yards, that's, our, that's the biggest size um, fresh pile that we can build. And so we, when we break it down based on the proportion, so you want to do that by volume first. This is where it gets a little bit tricky because you are constantly having to convert between volume and mass through the bulk density. Um, so that's kind of annoying. It's kind of interesting because when we build our compost piles, we utilize our proportions by volume. But for kind of policymakers and the general public, we're always reporting our kind of diversion in weight. So it's like tons of material diverted by the, from the landfill. Um, so it's just kind of an interesting thing. So that's where bulk density is important to kind of be able to convert between those two. So when we break it down based on volume, we have two cubic yards of food waste a week. Um, that's our like capacity that we can process in this design. And then we have 2.3 yards of wood chips per week. And then 0.66, which is about two thirds cubic yards of manure each week that we're going to be layering into this pile. And then I converted those into kind of working tools. So we get our food waste in 27 gallon bins. And so that's approximately 15 bins that size. Um, wood chips, uh, we work within wheelbarrows, which are approximately six cubic feet. So it's about 10 wheelbarrows. Uh, manure is also in wheelbarrows. So it's about three wheelbarrows. So it gives us an idea of how many uh, wheelbarrows and bins we're going to be using in building our first pile. So these are the bulk density estimates that I use based on the materials I've worked with. And you may have different estimates um, based on the materials that you're working with. So food waste, I estimate at about 1,000 pounds per cubic yard. Wood chips are about 600 pounds per cubic yard. Manure is about 800 pounds per cubic yard. And plant trimmings, I estimated about 500 pounds per cubic yard, although I didn't include that in my recipe. Um, but you, you could include that in your recipe if you wanted to. So simple bulk density test is to get a five gallon, gallon bucket, record the weight of that, start to fill it with material, drop it on the ground a little bit, because when you first put the material in, it's a little bit fluffy, so you kind of compact it a little bit. Um, you fill that bucket with material and get the weight you subtract the weight of the bucket, and that gives you the weight of the material in a five gallon volume. And so you get that number in pounds per gallon, and then you can convert that to pounds per cubic yard or whatever units will work well for you. So based on our two cubic yards a week of food waste, um, that translates in terms of weight 
to about 2,000 pounds per week or one ton per week. Okay, so basically at this point we have been able to estimate the total amount of food waste that we can take into our site on a weekly basis. So it's capped here at 2,000 pounds per week. So potentially our actual capacity is a little bit higher than this. Um, it is a good idea to kind of underestimate your capacity. You would rather underwhelm yourself than overwhelm yourself in general. Um, and then as you feel more comfortable taking more material, um, you can start looking at ways to kind of expand the amount of material you can process on your site. So we have our weekly processing capacity or if we've been taking good weights and data collection, we have our actual diversion estimates. And then we can convert that to a greenhouse gas benefit. And there's a document from the California Air Resources Board that has a quantification methodology based on peer-reviewed literature um, that created an estimate for the compost emission reduction factor per ton of feedstock that was composted. All right, so at this point, we have calculated our processing capacity versus actual diversion, which is like the data that we're going to collect. Um, and either of those can be translated into our greenhouse gas benefit, which is like metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent that we're saving from emitting into the atmosphere. So there was a document from the ARB that created a compost emission reduction factor. Basically, it's just a factor per ton of feedstock that you have composted. So we're going to do that calculation, and that's going to give us our carbon dioxide equivalent. And then there's a calculator from the EPA where we can translate that into um, passenger vehicles removed from the road and all sorts of other kind of more accessible ways to understand what that number means. Just to show you how that emission reduction factor came about, uh, yeah, you're not going to read all of that, but I'll just, I'll just tell you what it consists of. So they have a reduction factor associated with decreased soil erosion, a factor to account for the reduced fertilizer use, factor to account for reduced herbicide use, and then a conversion factor to convert from tons of compost to tons of feedstock. So there is a, they have their own kind of bulk density estimate in there and then the emissions from the composting process itself. And this is based on industrial scale composting. So they are looking at emissions from the use of large scale equipment, um, diesel based tractors and things like that. And there are like very minimal emissions from the compost process itself. There is some CO2 respired, a little bit of methane release, but it's like minimal compared to the anaerobic decomposition process in the landfill. So anyway, we're taking all of the benefits and subtracting the emissions from the composting process. So that's how that factor came about. Total emissions from composting process subtracted by the benefit. That's how we get our reduction factor. So in the end, they put out these estimates for food waste at 0.62 um, metric tons of carbon dioxide per ton of feedstock input. So this is based on your feedstocks um, input. Yard trimmings at 0.44 CO2 per ton and then mixed organics at 0.56 CO2 per ton. So I'm going to use these different values for our different feedstock materials. So based on our weekly generation, weekly uh, processing of food waste, we're at the capacity of that site, we're able to do 52 tons per year. Um, I multiplied that by 0.62, and that gives me 38.44 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. equivalent. Annual wood chips is about 35.8 tons per year. I multiply that by 0.44, it gives me 15.8 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Annual manure is about 13.7 tons per year. I multiply that by 0.56 and that gives me 7.7 .7 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So the wood chips I used the yard trimmings estimate and then the manure I used the mis mixed organics estimate. So that's how I broke it down and the food waste is food waste. And so I added up all that together and get my total annual greenhouse gas benefit of 61.9 metric tons carbon dioxide equivalent. 
So that's like the most amount of carbon dioxide reduction I can get based on the size and capacity of this space. So we're gonna go to this greenhouse gas equivalencies calendar. So it's epa.gov slash energy slash greenhouse dash gas dash equivalencies dash calculator. And we calculated 61.92 metric tons CO2 equivalent. And that translates into 13.5 passenger vehicles driven for one year. So that's our GHG savings um, translated into cars, essentially. And it gives you a whole list of other options, such as miles driven, gallons of gasoline. So other kind of estimates or equivalencies are like gallons of gas, gallons of diesel, pounds of coal, tanker trucks, homes energy, barrels of oil, etc. 7,500,000 smartphones charged is what we're also saving. Garbage trucks, trash bags, carbon sequestered by tree seedlings. So it gives you all of this uh, information. So whoever you're trying to convince, you should use the most appropriate convincing one for them. All right, so that's how your capacity estimate works. So if you're coming into a space and you want to develop a proposal, you can be like, this is the estimated capacity of the site, which translates to this greenhouse gas benefit. Um, so that's what we're trying to propose to bring into this community. On the other hand, you want to showcase what your project is actually do doing. You can weigh all of your feedstock materials and collect that data. Um, and so this is a look at what Food Cycle has, Collective has been collecting and processing since they started about a year and a half ago or so. So this is data since March 2020, 15 months of waste diversion and composting. So not 100% of that material has gone to Buena Vista because they do drop off at other local gardens. Um, but um, as, as an entity that diverts um, organic materials and composts, I just looked at the total amount of diversion and composting that they did. And so this is not based on site. This is just uh, the total amount that they did altogether. So in terms of, so this is over 15 months. So total amount of food waste diverted composted was 31.88 tons. Um, wood chips is 25.5. And this is based on the recipe. So when we're actually receiving loads of wood chips, they're in like 15 or 20 yard loads. Um, so that's something that you can document as well. Um, also manure loads, you can document receiving those loads as well. So you just have that in your records. Um, but this is just back calculated based on the recipe. So 25.5 tons of wood chips, 8.5 tons of manure. So our total annual greenhouse gas benefit is 35.7 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And so that's equivalent to 7.8 passenger vehicles removed from the road. So in the beginning, things were slow. There was just a small quantity of food waste that was getting picked up. Uh, now there's a lot more food waste that's getting picked up. Um, and so that's why like this number is less than the total capacity of the site. So, um, so they could be picking up more materials, like we have capacity for that. So that's, that's why it's helpful to understand your capacity uh, limitations so you have an idea of how much food waste you can bring and process on the site.